I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the crisis that it's now obvious to everybody that we're already walking through. And I have such a special guest today with coffee with Lynette, Shad Sullivan. One of our wonderful viewers sent me a video uh, of his that went viral where he was talking about the breakdown of the food supply chain and what farmers are forced to do as they are importing food into the U.S. He also had a lot to say about quality and everything else. Now, RCAF USA is actually a Ranchers Cattlemen Action Legal Fund United Stock Growers of America. And it is the largest producer-only membership-based organization that exclusively represents U.S. cattle and sheep producers on domestic and international trade and marketing issues. So there's a lot to talk about today in that regard. Now, Shad is actually RCAF USA's private property rights committee chair, which is something that is very, very personal to him because he has actually seen firsthand families losing family farms. And we have so much, and as you guys know, we, this is one urban farmer to a real live lifetime rancher. And you guys know how important food is. We've just experienced it in the pandemic. So I would really like to welcome you, Shad, for coming today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me on. Well, it's, it's really a pleasure. And the video that you did, we've posted the link to it so everybody can go and watch it. But there are a lot of issues that we're talking about here. Um, number one is that uh, what is going on in the food supply and the consolidation in the industry. Can you address how that's impacted the prices and has clogged up the whole food supply chain for us, please? Well, uh in the last 40 years, we have seen a, um, a move to, towards vertical integration in our industry, many other industries as well. Yeah. And what it's done is it, it has um, created this uh, shortfall of competition through, <clears throat> excuse me, through acquisitions and mergers <clears throat> of beef packing companies. And it's not just the, you know, the beef industry, but it's other industries as well. But what has happened in the beef industry, uh, our government has allowed uh, acquisitions and mergers of beef packing companies to come together and result, and that has resulted in uh, only four main beef packing companies um, that control 85% of the beef supply chain. Uh, down, what that has created is a, uh, a lack of price competition in the live cattle market across the, which we have seen uh, for the last uh, several, you know, multiple decades. And uh, with that, uh, we have basically put our eggs in one basket, uh, so to speak. And with the coming of COVID, it really released and uh, acknowledged the dangers of putting our eggs in one basket, because now we have uh, the disease that has spread across the nation. Um, workers in these uh, processing facilities cannot get back to work. They're, they're afraid to go to work. Um, and so you have a backlog or a bottleneck of the beef supply chain not, not being able to get through to the consumer. We have um, uh, plenty of cattle. We have great demand. Uh, it's just turning that product in, uh, those cattle into a beef product is a problem right now. And you're seeing it on the shelves as we speak across the nation. We have a shortage of, of beef and I get thousands of calls uh, since the video saying, where can we get our, where can we get beef and, and how do we get bought past this problem? Well, one of the things that we were talking a little bit about before we are doing this interview was being a locavore. In other words, staying local to buy your, you know, to buy your beef and, and your farmers, you can get it at the farmer's market. That's what I have done. 
Right. And, and, and that has created an incredible amount of movement in that farm to table uh, lifestyle it, just in the last, I mean, it's been gaining popularity, you know, through the years. Uh, but just in the last two weeks, since this problem has occurred, um, we are seeing uh, hundreds of thousands of people trying to find other resources for their meat supplies. And so, uh, you know, I had a call today from a, a gentleman in Houston, very nice guy. He says, we had no idea this even existed. Uh, how do we find local, local uh, processors or local uh, producers to, to buy our, our beef from? And so that's been a great thing to see happen on the local level, on the regional level, get these pack, these smaller packing plants uh, up and going so they can provide for their communities, number one, and number two, provide uh, a safe and healthy uh, product that we know where it comes from. And uh, that's been a real joy to see. We've seen action on the state levels from uh, state legislators saying, hey, we got to bypass some things, some rules in the short term to uh, enable consumers to get the product that they want and need. And yeah. so that's been really heartwarming for me. You know, um, you, you just reminded me of something and it was a number of years ago, one of my clients had come out and he went out and he hunted elk. And, um, he, and he's, he and his wife stayed with me and as a gift, he gave me part of that and I had to go out to a local meat processor and, and get that meat which right. you know so there are small local processors as well as what you're saying there are although they're they're very small in number i think since uh, 1979 or 1980 we have lost due to the consolidation of the food supply we have lost um, 800 local and regional uh, uh local i should say local packing companies and then 45 uh larger more regional regional wow. pack companies and that has taken a direct hit uh since a direct hit on the consumer uh because they're unable to do that but with that being said in the last two weeks we now have uh many startups coming into play many older facilities uh getting refurbished and that's coming online and that that's, that's one good. of the most exciting things to see uh happen because these people can really uh, know what they're getting right and they're excited to be a part of it and the, the consumer you know I've had a lot of, of kickback on the video from people in my own industry and uh, uh, what's been I've actually been accused of of ruining the relationship between the consumer and the producer and I find it just the opposite because I've got yeah. hundreds of thousands of messages that I cannot get to saying Thank you. Help us understand how we can be more involved. And so we're uh, at our CAF USA and myself, we're going to get right down to the nitty gritty on this and start working with the consumer because in this problem, two people have been left out because of money, right? Big money conglomeration. It's the yeah. producer. The producer's hurting the consumer. The consumer's being, I, I'm not going to say lied to, but there's deception going on towards the consumer. And this has got to end people ask me all the time, well, what would you do to change the industry? And I say, we have to get to the nut cutting and get the corruption out, bring back competition and be truthful, transparent, and honest with the American public because they are the king to us, right? Oh, I, I would say amen to that. I'm all about that. It, it's, you know, how many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? So I know that we put on the website um, the link from RCAF on where people can go to find out locally, but what else can people do? Well, I urge every American to reach out to their uh, legislative constituents and say, hey, we've got some issues that we're concerned about and we need, we need help. So we need, number one, we need to break up the Packers. We need to break up these big conglomerates and get back to a competitive uh, edge because honestly, the, uh, and I, I'm not against big, don't get me wrong. I, I am all for the American dream, but when, when you have take, for example, right now, as of yesterday, um, I didn't do the math, but other people have done the math. You have the four big meat packers uh, in box beef sales profiting 
you know, near or above $2,000 per head, while at the same time, um, producers are losing hundreds per head, we have a little problem. And they're the ones that have been pushing, uh, you know, you've heard the word sustainability. They've been pushing right. sustainability on us for 10 years. And sustainability is a fraud. I, I yep. will stand by that forever. And what I find ironic in this whole situation about sustainability is when it came down to it and we had danger come to our land in the form of COVID-19, they're the most unstainable uh, uh, group of people. There, We have store shelves empty and that is not supposed to happen in America. Oh, you're so right about that. And the food prices for meat, um, how much have they gone up in this crisis? Do you know those numbers? Well, I don't know the numbers or percentages um, um, right off the top of my head, but I will give you an example. In Pratt, Kansas, yesterday, at, and I'm not sure which store it was, um, ground beef was $9.98 per pound. It was $10 per wow. pound. Wow. A month ago, it may have been only $4 per pound, right? So we, we see this exponential uh, growth in, in uh, levels on the retail while we're backing off on the live cattle prices and it's hurting producers. And one thing we have to remember with producers is we have these overhead costs that everybody ha else has, but we have more. So I'm just, for example, myself and my family, um, I, I'm paying an enormous amount of uh, for my health insurance every month, right? Mm -hmm, enormous. Mm -hmm. It's astronomical what I'm paying. Well, see, what people don't understand is every single bill we have must come out of the cattle. And so our overhead grows, our, re our income is diminishing like crazy. And then on the retail end, those packers are getting uh, what they want and more, so. It's, so that's uh, where the that's where it goes. The consumer's paying more. You're getting less. Yes. Okay. In, in fact, I think I just watched your interview that you recently did with Patrick Bet David, and um, it was a great interview. Uh, I have the link below for everybody to go and watch that as well. And uh, I think you mentioned something. So please correct me if I'm wrong. That uh, your cost to raise a cow is. 1200 but what you're getting for it is 900 so how how now i'm just a regular guy i figure my math is you know I, i've been in business for 30 years so i i i don't know if i'm right here or not but uh, on my on my level yes so i'm putting uh see i'm i'm the second wave of the um the beef industry so you have the cow calf guy and then you have a stalker guy and I, so I buy the calf off the cow, uh, cow calf guy, and I grow that individual animal to a certain weight or time. And so I have inputs, cost inputs. And so, yeah, right now in the last three years, um, we, I, it's costing me about $1,200 and I'm getting back about 900 to $950. That, that's not good. That's got, that's not good business since it's terrible. And, uh, I'll, I'll just show you the difference. So when, mandatory country of origin labeling was implemented uh, uh, in 2014, we had a, uh, that was the peak of the cattle industry. And so we had a, uh, a, a drought that, of course, there was a lot of cattle on the market. I don't deny that, but Congress repealed country of origin labeling. Um, in, two th in the fall of 2014, I think I received, uh, when I sold my cattle off of grass, $1,600 per head. And so here I am selling them in 2019 for 950 or $60 per head. You have a thousand dollars difference there, you know, that, that, that we've lost in value across the industry. Well, now you multiply that by say in my operation, a thousand head or 2000 head, that's an enormous amount of income that it we're sure missing is. Lost opportunity. So here's a question for you. Um, do you use futures contracts to hedge to make up that difference? I am one of the few people that do. Uh, most cow calf guys do not. As a as a stalker operator, I my it, it's a high risk, high reward uh, system. It's very risky. I use those um, when I can. Uh, I'm normally in it. 
uh, yes, I hedge every year if I can. Last year, I was unable to. 2015, I was unable to. And uh, so, but when I can, I do use it as a uh, insurance tool against price in price protection. Yes, I do. Well, the re part of the reason why I asked you that, and the, the slide should be up for everybody to see, but the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency runs derivatives in the FDIC insured banking system every quarter. And so if, if you're looking at this, the end user like Shad is way down here. It's just a very minor part of that market, but the speculative user, so the banks, the hedge funds, the, the guys, this is just about a trade for them. And we have seen over the years, and, and you know, being in the physical precious metals arena too, and oil went negative. You're going to pay right. somebody to take that oil, right? Right. right? So do you think that part of what you're experiencing and the ranchers are experiencing in the de decline in pricing is based upon these futures contracts where it costs them, like I, I actually... Sorry, I didn't actually look before, but I, I, I know in metals it's 150 bucks to control 500 ounces. And so I would imagine that leverage is very similar to those it, contracts. It, it is, and it has hurt our industry. Uh, back when I was in college so long ago, I remember you know taking futures and options, and I remember saying, okay, uh, you make a trade, there's a buyer on one end and a seller on the other, right? And, you, and there was a delivery point and date, correct? Right. Well, that, is, that is no more because now it's all paper traded and it has created a astronomical train wreck in the cattle industry because they use that as leverage. And uh, so what yeah. I have personally is I have separated that uh, as a different business. So I do use it to hedge every single, every single contract I have. I have cattle to back it up because I sign a piece of paper with my uh, my uh, organization or, or the, the business that I use to do those hedges. And I say, you know, that piece of paper always says, are you using this for hedging purposes? And I, and that's what I do. So I back that up with cattle, but I treat right, it legitimate. I treat it separately. Right. But you're not a speculator. I'm not. You are, no. you have a legitimate business and you need to make sure because how can yeah. you, how can it cost you 1200 bucks when to grow a cow when you're only getting 950? So there is a legitimate use. It's those speculators. Absolutely. You're being squeezed from every, every, every end. Direction. Every direction. You're exactly right. And it's really become a problem. And I think they're going to have to uh, take some of this into consideration. You know, I've got friends in my own, in my own, own camp that are like we need to get rid of uh, the CME in the future. Well, I've used it to my advantage over the years, so I'm kind of I'm kind of like, well, we got to be careful, but it, we do need to bring integrity back to it. That, that has to happen, and it's like everything else. I mean, how how do we do that? How do we bring integrity back? Well, you know, I think that you just talked about a really fantastic opportunity because there is always opportunity in crisis if you get past the fear and you look and you were talking about growing the local base, right? Yes. Whether it's, oh, I mean, I mean, I think that we have to say no to what the guys that are just about the power and the money is about. And we're even talking about the money because if you get paid in the fiat dollar, so the U.S. dollar, which is backed by debt, you can't even save that. It loses value over time, it, it intentionally. Correct, correct. Right. You know, I, let me touch on this. I, I was going to touch on this a while ago. With that local supply, these, these local packing companies, which are few and far between now, um, they have seen an upsurge in their business so great that here in North Texas, I know of two small packing companies that have uh, had their days filled, their kill days filled out until mid 2021. This is a, a movement that is so exciting for, for them and for the consumer. And I think that with the, uh, the release of or the COVID-19 uh, taking place, I think that it has, uh, 
alarmed the consumer. They want to know more now and they yes. want where this food comes from because it does come to down to a food safety issue. They want to know now. And I think they're willing to pay a little bit more for that. I, 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 you know, I, I'm into that. I'm totally about supporting the local community because when you do that, guess where the money stays? In the That's local right. community. That's one thing that we've been uh, trying to press onto people. Now, I'm not against trade. I am, right. I be clear, I am for trade, importing, exporting, but I think we need to balance this trade up because it is not balanced. Uh, but one thing you have to remember is these people importing all of this beef, they don't pay your local taxes. They don't pay for flowers at the flower shop. They don't keep the schools and churches open. They don't uh, support these youth um, sales that, that we have for fundraisers. and. And that's where I think it's a very important that we have to get back to the basics and back to the root of the, of the problem. Listen, I went through college and, and I didn't realize it at the time that I was, uh, my college was less uh, sticky about it than a lot of other agricultural colleges, but how they were pushing vertical integration. And I thought yeah. even before I came home, my dad is deceased now, but I thought, well, that's a good thing, you know, get the middlemen out. Well, now I can see it's a community killer. It's an absolute community killer. And we're not only fighting for these communities now because of these food supply issues, we're fighting for our own nation because of the food supply issues. And I think we have to, we have to get back to the basics. I, I agree with that. Now you had, I want, there's a couple things I want to ask you about. Uh, okay. Number one, how can we ensure the safety of the workers at those plants? I mean, is there some way that we can really ensure that? Because that's part of the problem. People are afraid it to is. go to work. Well, it is, and uh, it's, a, it's a real fear. I think, you know, Amarillo, Texas right now is experiencing the effects of that uh, as uh, so many of these workers are, are foreign born and uh, they're, they're living mm -hmm small compounds with each other, you know, and, and it's created that, that problem maybe of a little bit of spread. Um, I think they're more fearful of going to work and getting it. Uh, but I think those packing companies have done a good job from what I'm hearing of, of spreading those workers out, doing different time shifts at different intervals and getting some protection protective gear onto with those people. And uh, I think it's working uh, and I hope it continues to. Yeah. Well, you know, makes a lot of sense to me. And even going uh, more local, if people are willing to pay a little bit more to the money that will come back to them in more jobs, because the local community, the small business, is roughly half of the, uh, of the employment. And we're gonna need a lot more jobs opening up and it, just the oh, opposite. Absolutely. So absolutely. that kind of leads me to the mandatory country of origin labeling because, okay. and I'd like you to talk more about that and why that would even matter to, I mean, I know why it matters to me, but why would that matter to our viewers? Well, let me be clear in that mandatory country of origin labeling is not the cure all and end all, but it is, um, in my opinion, the, at this moment, um, it is a freedom maker. It's a liberty maker. And I believe that the U.S. consumer has every right to make a choice, an internal choice of where their food comes from. We have in, in the United States, every single product has a country of origin label on it, except beef and pork. And that is a problem because what they can do is they can import lower quality beef and mix it into our, our cattle, our, our beef. And so their profits go up, they gouge at the retail level, they oppress our markets and it's more money, more money, more money, which increases more power, more power, more power. Now, the reason that mandatory country of origin labeling is uh, in Important to the consumer is because it's just that they know where their beef can come from. Now they might not choose the probably the more expensive product, which would be our product. But our product is far superior than any product in the world. Canada kind of gets close to ours, but uh, we have 
regulations that we have to adhere to, environmental regulations, we have local regulations that that we all have to adhere to in production agriculture, especially the beef industry, and other countries do not have to do that. And that is where uh, the differentiation of the product makes sense, just makes common sense, and comes into play. Hey, if you want to be a consumer and you want to support that Canada, New Zealand, Brazilian, Argentinian, Japanese, whatever it is, that steak, you go buy it, but you need to have the choice to pick it. And I exactly. do this whole ordeal more and more. Everybody wants homegrown American beef. They want to know where it comes from. And, and uh, you know, my adversaries in, in my industry that do not support mandatory country of origin labeling, um, they say it's more government in, intervention. You see, producers are independent. We love our country and we'll die for our country. So they don't want uh, government mandates all the time coming upon us. But in the same breath, those same, those same people say, okay, but we want radio frequency ID, ID ear tags in these cattle so we can trace that animal from hoof to plate. Well, that's got- Blockchain. Yeah, that's, that's a private property rights issue. It becomes uh, uh, an intervention into your personal life, right? And so there's the difference for me is uh, mandatory country of origin labeling is it creates liberty and freedom for the consumer while these other things that they don't that they don't mind having government intervention actually takes away your liberty and freedom and so i i don't see the connect of why they why they don't see that the way i do but may you know everybody's different so well if if uh in this country we have to adhere to these really strict rules yes then you can feel a lot more confident about what your consuming right Absolutely. and the more you get to know your rancher and your farmer and where your food comes from and the water and the soil and all Absolutely. of that i mean that enables you to consume something that's actually going to support your best interest and your ability to think absolutely absolutely so it's an overall uh, health and nutritional food safety environmental issue and that that's why i have a problem with this sustainability movement is because we've been sustainable we've been doing this as american ranchers for the right. last years and this is nothing new new for us it's just the control mechanism that they are wanting to enforce on us but uh we you're right it's it's an overall view of the whole product from top to bottom and uh, we have the best and the safest supply in the world we're lucky we we can do it you know we our meat is inspected. Uh, it's inspected in high regard. Um, some of these import uh, imports are all inspected. Let me make that clear. But maybe not on the level that we have. You know, uh, the Brazilian JBS. You know, they they did not send tainted beef to the United States, but they sent it all over the world um, last year and got caught in that scandal. And so we don't want to get into something like that. Um, you know, I touched on the imports from Namibia um, in my video. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not against importing those animals, uh, but to me, at a time when our bread lines are as long as they've been in since the Great Depression, and we're talking about uh, destroying our harvests, right? And, and doing that, why would we be importing this beef? Now, I, I understand why that set of beef was imported but um it's it, some things just aren't making sense right now yeah i yeah i would agree with you and you know really is all about educated choices you can make any choice you want but please let it be educated everybody that wa is watching this show knows that that's what i'm all about you don't have to agree with me here's right. all the data here's all the links and Absolutely. then whatever you want to do is entirely up to you. Absolutely. And that's what liberty and freedom is all about, right? We, that's why we live here in America. Let me, let me back up a little bit and be clear to the American people. Um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people twist my words. Uh, not a lot, very few. I've had, it's been 99.5% positive, but I have those, that sector of people in my industry that have tried to twist my words. We are not, we are not euthanizing cattle in the United States. 
And thank, okay. thank Donald Trump, we won't because um, uh, he signed the executive order to keep those li- those processing lines open. Um, two days ago, he came out and said we're going to buy three billion dollars worth of uh, product to feed uh, you know to feed Americans, needy Americans. That's a lifesaver, and I I applaud this. Trump for that. I appreciate that. Uh, So, you know, we're not euthanizing cattle, but uh, the protocol was probably there. You know, cattle are a little different than other other uh, enterprises, uh, say pigs and chickens. I was going to say, are we euthanizing pigs and chickens? We we have had to during this time. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there is a lifespan that they that they have to um, adhere to, you know, and if you can't get through the processing uh, facility because of that bottleneck, you're going to have to do something with it. And I think it's the same way with the vegetable crops. Yeah. And, you know, you've seen the milk being dumped and you know, that waste, that waste is hard on my heart because yeah. uh, I, I'm the son of a child of the depression. Right. And my dad told me about, um, about in the thirties and fifties, he wasn't alive in the thirties, but, um, he told me about the 1950s due to drought and disease that, you know, the government came out and they had to euthanize cattle on the ranch. And so thankfully we, our technology is incredible. Our, the mines in the beef business are incredible. We're very, very good people. And uh, we're not going to have to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I pray we don't have to do that. And I applaud President Trump for really getting on that in a hurry. So, yeah. Well, I think that, <clears throat> yeah, because as I've watched that, and I've also been watching the food lines grow as unemployment has grown, and it's just mm. like, I know what you mean. That that was the whole reason why I did, I mean, I only have half an acre, so we're not yeah. talking about a lot, but I've been able to, you know, give people, I do, every time I go out on my walk, I bring eggs or I bring whatever I have from my property to share. And, and isn't that what it's about right now? I mean, we our unemployment yeah. is... This thing happens so fast. Who would have ever thought this would happen this fast in America, where people are truly, truly our people, the American people, those who have fought and died for us, those those who have worked so hard to just grab a part of the American dream, and now we've got uh, hunger lines, and uh, then we're destroying crops. That didn't make sense to me, and that's one of the reasons I did the video uh, along with the USDA press release that bothered me. And so, uh, yeah, I think that... Now is a great opportunity for us as Americans to come together to save our country, to save these industries, get back to the local level uh, in supporting, you know, your local, your, your, your all local business. But remember, the farmers and ranchers are the ones that hold these rural communities up. And if they're gone, if they are gone, they're, those communities are gone. And yeah. uh, there's no doubt that if something isn't fixed this year, I've had people argue with me, but I'm, I've talked to bankers in the Great Plains and all of them are saying the same thing. There is no doubt if something isn't fixed soon. And I mean, this has to be fixed soon. This fall into mid next year, we'll see the greatest exodus of producers in our nation's history go out of business. And wow. you know, it's serious. It's a very serious situation. And I'm on their team, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, so what can we do to change that outcome? Because this is the this is the point of community. We can come together and make a difference. Yeah. What can and we I think, do? Well, I've asked a lot of people that myself, and I've thought about it and thought about it. And you know, they've got this uh, uh, government, what they call bailout, supposedly coming. And and let me be clear about this: the American rancher doesn't want a bailout. They want a fair market. Right. And so, I think that the first thing we have to do is go after those breaking antitrust laws. We have the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921 that ensured a fair uh, market playing field for everyone from the producer to the packer. And we need to, we need to enforce laws under that act uh, to go after these people breaking antitrust laws. We have to break up those big monopolies. Uh, we have to bring back, that's the only way we're gonna bring back competition, true competition mm-hmm. in the workplace. I mean, we're used to highs and lows, but we're used to lows and lows. And it's getting really, it's it's gotten to where it's totally un- unsustainable. You know, I always say, I've pulled a chicken out of the hat again, right? And that's what I did last year. Um, 
at the end of the year, we lost so much money due to a, a fire in a beef packing facility in Southwest Kansas. One fire created an astronomical loss in market value in one day. I mean, over the weekend, wow. in one trading day, and it killed me. I mean, it absolutely hurt me. Uh, the Lord has showed me a lot of favor and uh, has allowed me to, re, you know, make that up in in other ways. But uh, it, these problems are real and they're big and they have to be addressed. Sonny Perdue, our Secretary of Agriculture, you know, um, he promised that the, there would be an investigation into that fire. Um, and here we are nine months later, I could have had a, me and my wife could have had a baby and we hear nothing about that investigation. And now the COVID comes and the COVID made that fire look like nothing. Nothing. It made it look like nothing. We were talking, these people have taken 90 bucks for these uh, uh, harvest ready cattle. And, and I know a lot of uh, feedlot operators and, and cattle feeders across the nation who haven't had bids on cattle in so long because of the backup, you know, seven weeks because of the backup in, in the live cattle supply chain. So, you know, we have to do something. We have to take action. Um, and I think the first thing we have to do is end that corruption. That is my opinion. It's got to go. Now, isn't RCAF doing something um, about that? And is so there a way for the community to maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know, because I've never really even said anything like this on air before. But I mean, how how is that being funded? Is there something that we as a as a global community, as a local community that we can do to help that? Well, in 2000, uh, April of 2019, RCAF USA sued, filed a lawsuit against the four major packers. And we are right now, we are in the motion, uh, they are in the motion to dismiss phase. If that lawsuit goes on through, it could be historic in nature. If, uh, you know, the nice, thing about not nice i shouldn't use that term the thing about uh, all of this domino effect um on the covid deal is now the president thank you trump donald trump again um he has uh, required the, the department of justice to form an investigation against this monopolization and these packers so uh you know what rcaf usa has been is a visionary and we've been preaching against these uh, uh say you know telling the public this is what's going to happen if we don't fix this and fix it now we've done it for 20 years and it's fallen on deaf ear we've done it right. legis legislatively we've tried to uh, go to the executive branch and it's it just hasn't worked so that's why we filed the lawsuit um it was taken on and you know many people say well how do you how does rcaf get their funding well we are totally 100 percent um independent producer funded we are funded through our producers we do not take money we've been accused of some of the most horrific things um by our our the people on the opposite side of the column than we are and these things have just been you know i i guess that's how people are they they figure something out and they just it, it's a, like a snowball headed for hell it just gets bigger all the time and and uh our CAF usa listen i my dad was a man of integrity and uh, I wouldn't be at RCAF USA if it wasn't an integral organization. And uh, so, you know, we are independently funded by all of our members and that's the only place we're funded from. So, so you're up against all these big lobbyists that are funded <coughs> by Tyson and Cargill and JBS right. and National Beef. That's right. That's exactly And they right. have very deep pockets. They have very, very deep pockets. And, uh, you know, we, we as producers pay a, what they call a checkoff, which is a $1 assessed value per head every time you sell an animal. Uh, we pay into that system. That's, a, that's another government mandate um, and it's basically a tax. Well, we, the beef industry earns $80 million a year off of that. Half of that, approximately half that, goes to a lobbying organization that lobbies uh, in favor of those uh, multinational corporations and it, it, it it's hard to compete with that it is very hard to compete with that as small producers well if we can't do you know contributions is there should we call i mean how well, should we how can we support your efforts oh yeah absolutely 
you can become a member of RCAF USA, a non-voting member um, for I think $25. Uh, I, I'm not sure. You'd have to go to the uh, go to the website. And we we have a just recently set up. If you go to um, demandusabeef.com and sign a petition for mandatory country of origin labeling, there is a link there that uh, would allow for donation. And we've raised a little bit of money off of that. Um, also, it's a great resource. There's a great resource at RCAF USA, and it's called usabeef.org. It's a website, and what that does is it puts producers and um, consumers together, and you can buy beef. I think that's I think that's really really critically important. I mean, I know when I was eating beef, at, I still have a bunch in my freezer. I would just buy like a half a cow, and then that was enough for my children, and you know, and I've given mm -hmm. it to others too. So I think it's a great way to do it because you know you know what went into that cow. You know where it was raised. You know it was in the pasture, oh, or, or you know everything about it. And I. Absolutely. And I know there's a gentleman in South Dakota that has put together a similar, uh, a similar uh, movement on his web page. I had a guy in, in Houston call me this morning. He says, we want to work with you guys to uh, engage consumers more because we just, he says, we consumers are so dumb, dumbed down to it. It's not that they're dumb. It's that they've been dumbed down to it. We have right. a job as, as producers and organizations to educate um, those consumers. Now, part of that $1 a head tax, uh, tax, that checkoff is supposed to go to research, education, and promotion of the beef. And it used to do a really great job of that. I'm starting, and I'm pro checkoff, but uh, uh, there, there's some abuse there too. And we, you know, anytime you get that big money in and you get power, uh, things fall apart. And uh, we have to work against that. And, you know, I'm going to stand firm uh, but to, today, going forward for myself uh, and my organization, we're going to be heavily, heavily checked into the consumer because uh, we have maybe failed in that area to stay with the consumer. Yeah. Oh, we boy. To... I, I think that's a fantastic thought. I mean, it, it's something that, you know, it wasn't that I was a farmer before I started this, but food, yeah. when you're going through, and I, I um you know, I'm certain we're going, we have already begun to enter a hyperinflationary depression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're going through that, food is the single biggest issue for people. And what we've just experienced and are experiencing at the grocery store right now needs to be, and it sounds like maybe it is a bit of a wake up call yes. for everybody. We have Absolutely. to take back control of our food supply. We have to. We have to make sure that it's nutritious so that it actually helps us think better and make more educated choices. And, and the health issues. Look at all the health issues that are all over the place because of how poor the quality of, of our food is. Well, and I, you know, I'll, I think in America we are blessed with abundance. Yes, and we are that abundance has become habit. And we have not taught our children um, those basic human principles that require, uh, you know, where does your food come from? How did you, how did you sustain yourself back when, uh, think, you know, I think about my grandparents uh, in the, in the pre-depression days, you know, my great, great grandmother, she came out and homesteaded in Southeast Colorado and dug her own well. She was widowed. She had seven kids at her side, and wow. she created, she created an enormous uh, farm uh, and ranch on her own. And what I can remember them telling, you know, she was long gone before I came around. But they they always said, you know, she absolutely wasted nothing. Everything yeah. used, and everything you know in that animal was used. Everything on these farms were used, and. Uh, my dad, before he died, um, told me, he said, and he, he preached this a lot when I, when I was young, but he said, you know, uh, we are a spoiled nation. Uh, we, we've been blessed with abundance and we don't know what suffering is. And he said, the one thing that will um, create that appreciation again 
would be if everybody had to sit in the dark, cold and hungry, that would wake people up and say, you know what, we've had it pretty good. We better change some things. And so with this COVID-19 coming on, and now we have a few, uh, a few empty shelves, you know, who would have thought toilet paper would be an essential that blew my yeah. mind. Right? We're, 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 me and my wife, we were cooking up a storm cannon and stuff like that. And people are trying to find <laughs> toilet paper. Uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's certainly changed the mindset. And I hear a lot of people today mm -hmm. talking about their grandparents saying how the depression changed their way of thinking. And I believe COVID-19 is going to change our way of thinking. I believe that. And I hope that it is for the better and that it brings the community together and we start to take back control of our yes. food system, of our monetary system, yes. because it needs to be for, for the people. And Absolutely. it needs to be a lot more fair, not for the few, but for right. the many. Well, what, what, what we've gotten into is we have forgotten that we are a land of, by, and for the people, a government of, by, and for the people. We believe, uh, you know, the consumer is just sitting back saying, you know, what can the government do for me? Well, we are the government. We need to speak up. We need to take control of our corrupt systems. You know, Congress is corrupt. Uh, it's not, not everybody's corrupt, but as, as a whole, there are things happening that should not happen in the United States. And I think the people have to take back our country because, uh, you know, I was explaining this to somebody today. It's the food supply is at the very basic of, of our freedom. These are God given rights, right? And yep. we have to take those God given rights, not government given rights. We have to take them back and give them back to the people. And we have to let the people speak in majority and uh, do their job and run this country. We were built on greatness, right? It, right. Our forefathers were worked so hard and they were so independent. And I just, the struggles they went through to build this nation for us. And I hate that we are just sitting here throwing it away like it was nothing. This is the greatest country in the world and we need to stand and arise right now. We don't have another chance. This is the time. And I say that same thing about the beef packing industry. Right now, the producer has to take that control of his industry, his and her industry, because we have incredible minds uh, on both sides and we have to do it now. There is no other time. If we miss this opportunity, I think we're going to regret it. Oh, wow. I, I agree with you. This is the opportunity to take out, to take back both the foods, everything, everything. Yes, the people absolutely. need to really come together and take this back and take back control. You know, I, agree. I mean, hear what we do, you know, you're tangible, we're tangible because we're all about real good money that holds its value over time. It really is that simple. But what do you need? You need food. This is my personal mantra. Food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. And all of that is, pre, is preempted by private property rights. We must have the ability to produce the way we see fit in our own property. Because if you'll notice all of these other countries that have gone down the tubes, Venezuela, all of them, they lack, they have taken their private property rights away from them. And that's where it starts. And we've got to make, make sure we maintain those basic rights in the United States. Well, we've, we've covered a lot. I could keep going on. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no. Oh, no. This has been really wonderful. I mean, I mean, I love you. I really Thank do. You. We are so akin to each other and our thought process on especially yeah. the food piece. You know, it's your health and it's your wealth. And it's yeah. in that order because if, if you, you can have all the money in the world and if you don't have your health, what do you have? Absolutely. None of it matters. None of it matters. That's right. It really doesn't. So it's both of those things. But I have to ask you, is there anything else that you would like the viewers to know? You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I want the viewers to know that they've, they've got a great food system here. We, we've got to work on it. Um, they've got a beautiful country and we've, we've got to defend it and we've got to defend those liberties. Um, 
We are not killing, we are not euthanizing cattle at this time. I'm glad time. to hear that. I don't think w that will happen. I, I want to give thanks to uh, the good Lord and President Trump for, for that. Um, I pray that these guys get these, these uh, supply chains back to rolling, you know, and I, and I just say stand up. You know, it's time to stand up and make your voice heard. I am just a cattle rancher. That's all I want to do is watch my cattle grow. I love it. But ranchers cannot feed our country without a profit. And we, right. we have to have a profit to be able to do this. And uh, our margins de are decreased substantially over the last 10 to 20 years. And uh, we need some help. And we want to engage the consumer. We want the consumer to know that he and she is king. And uh, we depend on them while they're depending on us to put food on their plates. So that's, that's really what I want to say. Uh, you know, God bless America. I'm so thankful uh, and feel so favored to live in this country. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to lose that favor. I don't want to lose those opportunities that I've been uh, blessed with. And, you know, my, every person has a gift and my gift is um, communication and, and that's a God given gift. And so if I can help uh, in this process, I want to help in this process. I think the Lord has given me that platform now. I, you know, the, the video was just off the cuff. I didn't mean to offend people. I didn't mean to make people mad, which honestly, I've not gotten very many of those messages. I couldn't imagine you would. You know, I, I just want people to be aware of what's happening and not, not to, not to be dependent, be independent, think clearly, think independently, and uh, let's get, get our country back. That's what I want. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming today. This has been really wonderful. I appreciate well, it. We all appreciate it. Lynette, anytime. I, I appreciate you having me on and let me tell you, you know, let me tell my story. And that's what it is. We all have a story and I'm proud to be from ranching country. Well, I'm definitely glad that you are. And if you ever have another message that you need to get out, if I don't call you, you call me. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynette, so much. Thank you oh, so much. My pleasure. And to everybody out there, keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver outside of the system in your possession with no counterparty risk. We've got to take back, as Shad said, we've got to take back and protect our freedoms. So until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.